of a particular and comprehensive system of beliefs, observances, or worship. Three, which the individual demonstrates that he or she sincerely believes or is undertaking in good faith as a way of for connecting with the divine or as a function of his or her spiritual faith. What is key here is the sincerity or the honesty of the belief or practice claimed. So a rights claimant need not prove that others of the same religion or religious leaders share the belief or practice in question for it to merit legal protection. And in this way, the courts and tribunals have avoided entering into theological debates. As such, there's no set list of officially recognized religions, nor set way that each religion is required to be followed. Indeed, a growing range of non-traditional and non-deistic religions, such as Falun Gong, Wicca, Raelianism, etc., have been found by the courts to constitute a creed. Um, the Court of Appeal for Ontario has, however, found that political opinions generally are not considered a creed under the code. Now, under the code, organizations have a legal duty to keep their environments and services free from discrimination and harassment because of creed or religion. And prohibited forms of discrimination can take more direct uh, forms, such as refusing to hire someone because of their creed, or more the indirect forms, which are often referred to as constructive or adverse impact discrimination, which can be said to occur when rules or requirements that are not discriminatory on their face, nevertheless have the effect of limiting the rights or opportunities of individuals based on creed. So one ex a common example would be a dress code requirement of a, of a particular employer um, that conflicts with a religious uh, article of faith in terms of dress code. And if one were forced to choose between being employed or following their religious dictates, um, clearly that's the type of conflict, that's the type of situation that would constitute adverse effect discrimination. Now, mindful of time, I'll, I'll limit my comments on some of the more social trends that we're seeing in discrimination. Um, and merely note that there is, you know, interesting in what the previous uh, presenter had mentioned, this uh, avoidance of religious language. And, and, and so one of the uh, developments that has been known is a growing discomfort with those who openly identify as religious, regardless of the particular religion practice, sometimes connected to a sort of muscular secularism or liberalism. And in such a context, it's especially important to note that the right to be free from discrimination on the basis of creed also includes the right to have the needs related to one's creed or religion accommodated to the point of undue hardship. And these accommodations can take various forms, but uh, I won't uh, go into those uh, at this time. Uh, <clears throat> it's also important to note that not everything is protected, uh, not all aspects of religious practice necessarily are protected by the code. Generally, the more central the practice is to the core belief system, the more likely it would be protected. For example, celebrating a religion's high holy days would likely be protected while an employer would not be expected to give someone time off to staff their church bake sale. This is on the margins of, of, of their faith requirements. Another important poli policy principle is that the freedom uh, to hold beliefs is broader than the freedom to act on them. This is particularly the case where acting on those beliefs would have an adverse or harmful impact on the rights of others. Moreover, uh, it should be noted, you know, there's no right or human right to be free from contradicting messages or to, to not be offended or to encounter or be exposed to contradicting beliefs in the public sphere. Um, and nor can merely one assert a right without sort of demonstrating how uh, their freedom of religion has been infringed. But coming back to our topic tonight, uh, much of the debate in Ontario has centered on the appropriate limits uh, of religious expression and accommodation in public institutions. And from a commission policy perspective, there's nothing in the Ontario Human Rights Code that explicitly prohibits religious expression, activity, or association in public institutions. Indeed, in some cases, uh, this may be required. Uh, and it's frequently misconceived in this respect that a commitment to secularism in Canada uh, means that public space uh, need thereby be devoid of all manifestations of religion. Uh, 
Um, one example of this is a case in Nova Scotia, uh, where it, the town council prohibited uh, any forms of performances on the town stage that had a religious message. And when the reverend took this to the courts, this was deemed to be a form of discrimination on the basis of creed. So one cannot simply say on the basis of preserving a neutral or secular space that thereby or one can preclude or exclude uh, people uh, with a religious uh, affiliation. Um, as such, the default position should generally be to allow and defacilitate religious activity as long as a potential for discrimination does not exist. And such a potential does exist under the code where there's any element of compulsion, coercion, or pressure to participate or adhere to a professed religious belief or practice uh, for the right to be Free from discrimination based on creed encompasses the right to be free from the imposition of the religious beliefs and observances of others, whether or not a person practices a religion or creed or not. Much of the case law in this respect deals with distinguishing what qualifies as religious coercion or compulsion versus merely free expression. And had I more time, I could sort of give some examples, but uh, there is one quick example of a, uh, the Renfrew County Council who was um, taken to court uh, by a secular humanist for its opening non-sectarian prayers and it was seen to be an affront to those who don't believe in God or participation in prayer. And in fact, um, the Superior, Ontario Superior Court in this case found that a broadly inclusive and non-denominational prayer, even one that refers to God, while not consistent with the beliefs of some, was not an infringement of their religious rights. So the right to be free from religion, where there is an element of compulsion, is one limit on religion in public institutions, but not every expression of religion in public is necessarily coercive. And you know, so generally, you know, you know, there are these limits, but the default, uh, that's a clear indication of time. Is uh, and uh, just I would obviously to wrap things up. Uh, the last sort of major limit has to do with where rights uh, come into a clash with one another, and one right bumps against the right of, of another person's right, who's equally protected under the code. And often these are. Uh, competing rights situation. And the Commission's recently developed a policy and a framework for dealing with these competing rights scenarios um, that I encourage you to stay tuned to our website. But one of the most important principles derived from code and charter jurisprudence in this respect is that no right is absolute, but similarly there's no uh, hierarchy of grounds. This means that no one ground may automatically trump any other ground, including creed rights, particularly where the rights of others are impacted. In such cases, there is a need to, or maybe a need to balance the claims based on creed with other competing rights, whether these be disability, uh, uh, gender, sexual orientation, etc. Um, and in conclusion, um, you know, the code does allow for some exemptions uh, 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 on this general prohibition against, uh, against discrimination on the ground of creed. There's various exemptions uh, and exceptions that are made, but I won't go through those. In conclusion, it has been said, and I think with some merit, that how a society treats religious minorities uh, is often a strong indication of its tolerance and better yet embrace of difference and diversity in general. Given Canada's multicultural commitments to diversity and inclusion, as enshrined in Section 27 of the Charter and the Preamble of the Code, it is therefore particularly important from the Commission's human rights perspective that creed rights continue to be accorded equal recognition as other human rights in the interest of maintaining and nurturing a, deep, a diverse and inclusive Canadian society. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Warner. Alors, le Dr. Warner nous demandait euh, quelles personnes viennent de l'Ontario. Maintenant, je vous demande, euh, si vous pouvez lever la main, qui vient du Québec? Il y en a plusieurs aussi. Eh bien, la prochaine présentation est peut-être euh, 
Pour vous, notre dernier invité, voyez-vous, est la professeure Pascale Fournier, titulaire de la chaire de recherche sur le pluralisme juridique et le droit comparé. Ce soir, Mme Fournier nous parlera du projet de loi C-94, la loi établissant des balises encadrant les demandes d'accommodement dans l'administration publique et dans certains établissements. Euh, pour discuter donc, entre autres sujets, de l'impact de ce projet de loi sur les femmes portant le niqab, je vous prie d'accueillir la professeure Pascale Fournier. J'aimerais en profiter pour remercier euh, mes, mes consoeurs et mes amis euh, du euh, projet Religion and Diversity. Alors, euh, Heather Schiffy qui est ici ce soir, qui a beaucoup travaillé pour cet événement, et Laurie Beeman. Euh, je remercie également le Musée canadien des civilisations. C'est un grand plaisir, je crois, euh, pour nous, universitaires, d'avoir un dialogue avec les membres du public, alors de vulgariser euh, le, la connaissance, surtout lorsque euh, cette connaissance dans le domaine du droit là, a un impact concret sur les individus. Alors, j'ai un PowerPoint, euh, j'espère que vous voyez bien. Je vais commencer par euh, une lecture euh, qui m'a inspirée euh, ce soir, en fait, seulement il y a quelques heures. Euh, et euh, j'aimerais avoir, euh, euh, j'aimerais dire que j'ai écrit ce texte, mais j'ai euh, emprunté ce texte ici à l'exposition sur les religions. Alors, je vous invite à vous rendre à l'intérieur de, euh, de cette exposition, c'est vraiment remarquable. Le fracas des bombes et la lueur des incendies nous rendent sourds et aveugles à un fait massif. Des millions de fidèles de religions différentes vivent simplement côte à côte, en bonne intelligence, sans trop se préoccuper d'idéologie ni de théologie. Mais cette paix est toujours précaire. C'est que la religion est un pouvoir, et un pouvoir qui touche au nerf le plus sensible de l'identité individuelle et collective. Et, en tant que telle, elle porte le conflit comme la nuit de l'orage. Mais qu'est-ce que la religion Beaucoup de choses, trop de choses, en fait, pour qu'on puisse l'enfermer dans une définition unique. Des croyances et des mythes, des pratiques et des institutions, des textes et des traditions, des lieux et des itinéraires, la cruauté du sacrifice et la consolation de la prière, la fraternité des fidèles et la guerre contre l'infidèle, des figures de dieux et de saints, de héros et de vilains. C'est aussi une structure de pouvoir, un réseau d'échanges, une grille d'interprétation du monde, un bond contre l'angoisse existentielle de l'individu et de la collectivité. C'est enfin un système symbolique, pourvoyeur de sens, d'espoir, de valeur et d'identité. Et c'est précisément pour cela que la religion produit autant de violence. Ces choses-là sont assez importantes pour qu'elle vaille la peine de tuer et de se faire tuer pour elle. En effet, même les religions considérées comme éminemment pacifistes, Pacifique, l'hindouisme, le bouddhisme zen et, bien entendu, le christianisme, la religion du serment sur la montagne, du martyr et de la joue tendue, ont versé ou verse dans la violence. Oui, on a beaucoup tué au nom de Dieu. On a encore davantage tué au nom d'autres divinités, séculières celles-là, la nation, la classe, la race. Des sacrifices, des sacrifices offerts à ces divinités-là, notre modernité est tout ensanglantée. Alors, c'est un extrait d'un auteur, Elie euh, Barnavi, je dois avouer que je ne connaissais pas ce texte, directeur du Musée d'Europe, historien et essayiste. Et j'ai décidé de vous lire cet extrait parce que je le trouve vraiment très beau, mais aussi parce que euh, je vais parler aujourd'hui euh, de cet aspect euh, un peu punitif de la laïcité euh, et jusqu'où on peut aller pour euh, brimer euh, la liberté individuelle. Alors, je vais vous parler du projet de loi C-94 qui, euh, à ce jour, n'a pas encore euh, de force. Et peut-être qu'on se doute pourquoi. Il y a certaines critiques là, euh, qui sont véhiculées à l'endroit de ce projet de loi. Alors ici, j'ai plusieurs photos de femmes qui portent le niqab. J'ai choisi d'utiliser des photos différentes, certaines noires, certaines avec des couleurs, euh, certaines qui, euh, qui essaient là, de d'avoir un agencement avec leur, leur, leurs autres vêtements, donc la mode. Euh, parce que je me demandais comment un vêtement qui est porteur de sens et fluide dans sa signification, c'est-à-dire porté par certaines par conviction religieuse, par d'autres comme opposition à un monde occidental hypersexualisé, et par d'autres comme volonté d'établir une distinction entre les hommes et les femmes, comment cette diversité, en fait, est traduite juridiquement et socialement comme un objet homogène, et dégradant qui génère l'hostilité en Occident. Alors nous avons ici ce que j'appelle une panique identitaire généralisée, 
Alors, euh, des, euh, des, des projets de loi dans certains pays comme la Belgique euh, et la France, en fait, il ne s'agit plus de projets de loi, mais de lois qui vont jusqu'à euh, rendre criminel, en fait, le, le fait de porter le niqab, donc des femmes qui reçoivent des amendes et peuvent ultimement aller jusqu'en prison. Alors que dans d'autres pays, euh, les mesures punitives là, émanent